Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's Robo Alarm session. Today, it's my, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Jonathan Bisk. Jonathan is an assistant professor of computer science in Carnegie Mellon's Language Technologies Institute. His group works on grounded and embodied natural language processing, placing perception and interaction as central to how language is, learning, is learned and understood. Previously, he received his PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, working on unsupervised Bayesian models for syntax before spending time at USC's ISI, working on routing, um, the University of Washington for Common Sense Research, and Microsoft, Microsoft Research for Vision and Language. So uh, please, Jonathan, the floor, floor is yours. Thank you. Let me uh, try sharing. Able to see that OK? Mm, yep. Perfect. Cool. Awesome. Um, Thank you for the introduction. Thank you everybody for being here. This is gonna be kind of an overview of some of the questions and the history about what it means to build agents where like, specifically robots that we can talk to. And so there's gonna be a lot of questions in this talk um, and not as many answers. So what does it mean to talk to a robot? Well, that means that we have to define our terms of what is talking or what is a robot, for example. And I think that the place I want to start is really high level, which is um, why do we have language in the first place? So why is it appealing for us to talk to each other? And therefore, why would it be appealing for us to talk to a robotic agent to be able to yell at our Roomba when it does something wrong? And part of that means that we have to define what language is. We have to think about how language might be different from communication. So Cats and dogs communicate, but that's not really what we're talking about. You probably aren't barking at your Roomba. You actually want to specifically tell it what to do. So what's that distinction there? And then what form does language come in? So how would we want to convey this? Is it spoken or written only? Um, clearly, the answer to that is no. And um, more generally, kind of where does meaning come from? So when we say that we want to make sure that the system understands the meaning of no, 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 make sure that you don't clean in that room or make sure that you get that corner to our little robot, What, where is it supposed to learn the meaning of those terms? And so the easiest way for me to think about where it might learn those uh, terms meaning is to think about where we did in the first place. And so the basic thing that you do as a kid is you learn to play. So the most basic thing that happens, and you see this little video of, a, of this little girl and she's learning how blocks fit together. She's learning something about friction, rolling friction. She's learning something about gravity and stacking. So there's all these really basic concepts that you as a human learn as a kid just because you were playing. But you learned a lot of stuff because you had a teacher of some kind, whether it was a parent, whether it was friends. These people knew some information and they were trying to make sure that you could learn it as well. And then there's the place that those of us who are in, you know, gone through 12 years of basic education and then higher ed and so forth, spent a lot of time getting knowledge out of books, lots and lots of books. And that's basically where the large language models, the chat GPTs of the world um, are getting their knowledge. So they're getting their knowledge almost exclusively from that third category, not so much from the first two. And so that's, I think, where we're gonna start to see a disconnect between what it is that is impressive that we can do with large language models like ChatGPT versus what it is that we want to be able to do with a robot. And so I'm going to start off with what I think is just a really nice demo. And this is some work from Google called SayCan. People may have seen this from a year ago now, I think. Um, here he's going to instruct it that it's, he spilled a Coke and he wants to throw it away and then figure out how to clean it. And what's going to happen is the language model is going to take those high level tokens, that high level description, and then come up with high level um, sub goals for it to accomplish. So, well, if I need to take the Coke to the trash can, then picking it up first would be necessary. Then I'm going to have to put it down when I get to the right place. And then eventually you're going to see it actually go and find a sponge as the necessary tool for the cleaning. And on the one hand, this is incredibly impressive. Um, but I want to split it apart and talk about two different aspects of what's happening in this in this demo. So part of what's happening, which is really cool, is all this high level notion of what's next, what tools do I need? And I want you to think about that as something that a language model is very good at. 
because that's kind of like if you were to go to the internet and search for a recipe. Now, this is a custom recipe, but it's a recipe. It's sort of here's in high level description what these next dates are. And then the other part, which is hidden in the appendix of this paper, is just how much work is involved in actually getting all of those skills implemented. So how do we actually get it to know how to drive to a location? How do we get it to understand what it means to pick something up? And this is not new. So I want to situate us with some slightly older work. So 10 years ago now, this is some demos from Stephanie Telex, where she was instructing a uh, robot, in this case, a, uh, a forklift, an autonomous forklift, to go and pick things up in this uh, sort of outdoor space. So on the left here, it's picking up a tire pallet. And then she generalizes that and then starts to make larger, more complicated instructions like putting it at a specific location on the truck. So on the one hand, it's very simple. I'm taking something and I'm moving it somewhere else. On the other hand, I want you to really think about like the full stack here. She's speaking, so we have audio, which is what's then being converted to text, which is then being processed via her, in this case, Bayesian machine learning model in order to then figure out the core concepts for what needs to happen, who, you know, which object has what relationship to what other object, which then has to turn into the actual motor control for actually moving this thing around. Also, I just think it's impressive when you are having something autonomously move that uh, if it ran into you would hurt a lot. Um, so, so this is just to say, this is a kind of an area where we've seen a lot of advancement over the last decade, but also the core questions are still basically the same. And so I'm gonna to try to organize this talk a little bit into three core abilities that you would expect an agent to have, and then why those are interesting, how they've evolved, and what's maybe next. So the first thing is navigation. So you want an, an agent that is able to navigate the environment. It's able to understand where it is, where it's trying to go. You're able to describe some sort of goal, kind of like a you know if you had Google Maps. The second is manipulation. So you want a robot that's able to actually change things in the world. So the world is not sort of a static thing in the background, but instead it's something where they're able to say like, I want this in that location. And then finally, what we're building is towards the sort of collaboration. How do we get to a point where we have an agent that is working with us on something, and we're communicating in natural language in multiple terms? So this is kind of, I think, a trajectory for this research area. I'm going to give you a little bit of where we've gone along the way, and I'm going to do so, though, from a language bend. So we're going to only talk about these things in the context of language instructions. So we're going to start with navigation. So where were we, sort of keeping with the theme, uh, about 10 years ago. Well, what we did is we had um, simulators, which we still use now, they're just higher fidelity, where you would have some layout. So in this case, you have a layout of a, of a building that you maybe want to try to navigate through. And there's landmarks in that building. So you can see that there is, in this case, uh, some things on the walls. There's a different types of flooring. I realize it's a little bit silly. There's a lamp. And then we can ask people, if I wanted to navigate through here, what's an instruction that you would give a system? And they say, oh, in this case, take your first left, go all the way down until you hit, it, hit a dead end. And that's this path. Now, that's awesome. Um, I want to, maybe you didn't even think about it, but dead end. Dead end is a really interesting concept. Where is the system going to learn the meaning of that? So we could start to sort of use a dictionary and kind of uh, deconstruct that and be like, well, there's no paths from here. Um, okay, but that would mean it needs to know what a path is. And, and you can see how you end up with this pretty difficult question. And the other thing that is true, even in these older data sets, is that there's not one way to say things. One of the things that makes language so interesting is that every single person you ask to describe something is going to describe it differently. And so that same very short, very simple trajectory, that very simple path here, gets these four different descriptions. We had dead end in the first one. We have references to a hat rack or a coat hanger and the others, green octagons to describe the floor. So now we have to understand what that geometric shape is. And you can see how this can get complicated pretty quickly. But the core assumption in this older work is that the meaning can be defined in terms of a small set of functions. So there's turning, there's verification that there is some object. So it's kind of like computer vision working perfectly. And what's happened over the last 10 years is that we've weakened those assumptions. So let's talk about what it means to weaken those. Here we have a small set of, of, of actions that we can take. 
They're all basically explicit. Yes, I did it. No, I didn't. So there's no ambiguity there. Uh, and we can sort of perfectly verify things. Moving forward is a, a unit. So moving forward one. And so what then people did is they said, well, we've got really great cameras. We can do kind of like a Google Street View, but of houses. So these are, uh, this is a data set where they took houses that were actually scanned for real estate reasons. So people wanted to sell their house. They want you to be able to walk through it and understand what there is. And they said, let's take a path through that house and let's see how people would describe it. So almost exactly the same task, but now with real images and a real house. And we say here, exit the bedroom, turn left and exit the room using the door uh, and wait there. And this is what that house looks like overall. So on the one hand, again, you're thinking, well, exit, turn, you know, bathroom, door, there's probably not that many objects, but let's think about this from the agent's point of view. So you don't already know how to speak language. You're trying to understand what the person is asking you to do. You're trying to learn these concepts as you go along. And I wanna use this particular paper from 2019 to kind of illustrate why that's interesting or what's hard about that. And it's basically the question of alignment. There's what you are seeing, there's what you're hearing, and then you have what you're gonna do. And all three of those things need to be aligned in order for you to accomplish this task. So you and I read a sentence, or in this case, two sentences, like exit the bedroom, go towards the table, go to the stairs on the left, oh, sorry, three sentences. Um, and, you, and we understand that that is in order. There's a progression there. So let's look at what that would be like for the agent. Here's that same sentence, and here's what you see. So you realize that you see a bed to your left, you see maybe an end table to your right, you see this kind of doorway out into an open uh, area in front of you. This probably corresponds to exit the bedroom. And so once you've taken that action, you can cross it off your, your list. And in doing so, you've reduced the ambiguity about learning the next thing. So when you take a step into the main hall and now you're trying to look for a table, you aren't still looking for a bedroom because you kind of removed it. You've kind of, uh, no, no, I already done, I've already did that. And so there's this notion that part of what's making it possible for you to learn and therefore what we would want to be possible for our systems to learn is that you're figuring out what parts of the language instruction, what parts of the environment are aligned together, and you're keeping track of what you've done in order to make that easier and easier as you move along. So once you take that next action, you cross that off, you move, and now we're looking, they go to the stairs to the left of the couch, and so now that's, that, that's sort of the decision here. But we're not looking for a table anymore, even though there is one. We're not looking for a bedroom anymore, even though we might still be able to see a little bit. And so we're narrowing the set of possible things in the language that could align to what is still a pretty large set of things in the vision in order to make this task easier and easier. Now, this is actually basically what you did as a kid. You don't speak anything, you're babbling, and, you're, and your parent or whomever is telling you this is this, this is that, we want to go over there, and you're trying to figure out what is there, what is this, what is that, and the way you're doing that is that you're paying attention to what they're looking at, what they're pointing at, and you're using that cue to align the language concept to what you're perceiving, but this is a lot of data, so if you think about raising a kid for years, that's a lot of data, and so what we're trying to do with some of these data sets is get that kind of data. And so when we think about what kind of data we want to collect, what I've shown you up until now is really great, but it doesn't give you that same level of kind of fine grained, oh, this is where the person's looking. That's the kind of stuff that you used as a kid. And so what people have done since, so this is a really nice data set called Room Across Room from a couple of years ago, um, is that they actually figured out how to track the person while they're moving through this virtual environment and what they're saying. And then they present those as aligned data. And you see this with the colors here. So our starting point is in the living room. And what are they looking at when they say that? They're looking at the sofa. That in itself is really interesting. So now what's happening is that we're not only learning something about SOFA, which is gonna come up in a second, but we're also learning something about the type of room that contains a SOFA. There's this extra knowledge, this common sense type of knowledge about how houses are organized that is becoming accessible to our learning agent. And so we need this kind of data to help our system learn. 
But then there's this question, which is like, how much is ever enough? So how do I need like years and years and years of this data? Like how much data do we need in order to try to get to a point where we can just tell our Roomba not to go in that room? And depending on what your task is, you may not need a ton, but if we want a general purpose system, it's a pretty open-ended question. And part of what's so hard about it is because what you really want to do is take advantage of that play from earlier, right? So I said, well, as a kid, part of what was happening is that you were just moving around the environment. But if a parent asks you to go do something and you go off and, and, and try to do it, how do you know if you've made a mistake? How do you know if you found the thing that you're looking for? How do you know if you've gotten lost? And if you do figure out that you've gotten lost, do you know where you should retrace your steps to? So these kinds of questions start to make the learning problem quite a bit more difficult. So on the one hand, we've got an initiative that's giving us more and more nicely aligned data. On the other hand, we've got these questions that we also need to grapple with, which is if you have an agent that's in the world, it needs to think about its own abilities, its own limitations. And then that actually makes the alignment problem harder. The other thing is that if we're gonna make this more realistic, we wanna move past Google Street View. We wanna to move to real valued environments, continuous environments. And so this is that same exact setting from a second ago, but where it's now actually a continuous movement. So you have this really smooth movement. And this means that there's new things that open up. So that means that the meaning of left is a little bit more confusing. It's not actually just a, you know, that one action that we started with, it's maybe a, a sort of range of actions or a sort of region of locations that would all be okay. So our, a, our API, if you will, for the robot has changed. How far do you want me to move forward? How much do you want me to turn? But the nice thing about this is that this is what the real world looks like. And so that means that we can actually take those systems and put them on a robot and then start having them move around the world based off of those language instructions. So this is some follow-up work that uh, from some of the previous authors. And so you have some start location, some goal location in a room. And I'm actually gonna go ahead and skip over this slide and just show you um, kind of a, a demo from their system where you're seeing that first person view of the robot. You're seeing kind of that 360 view that we were seeing a little bit earlier, sort of looking in all directions. And then on the right, you're seeing the system build out a map, trying to figure out whether or not what it's seeing corresponds to each of the words in the environment. And so this is a, this is a pretty cool uh, proof, right? This is sort of like, you know, 10 years later, you've gone from that really, really simple simulator with the hat rack to now a robot that's moving around the environment that's understanding language. But you can actually make things harder. You could make things 3D. So that was a robot with wheels. But what if you had a drone? What if you were moving in space, you're you flying and so forth. And so here, I just wanna show you that this is something that the community has also been working on uh, where this system is figuring out from its input image on the left, this is what it sees. Um, it's predicting where, uh, what an overhead view of the world would look like, what the obstacles are that it's finding, and then trying to figure out how to navigate around that space. And the output here are forward velocity and yaw. So we've really moved to completely real valued sort of language is going all the way down to controlling the motors. So this gives you kind of a sense of where we are. It's clearly not solved. These are all sort of in the lab, these are constrained. Um, you, there's a lot of work to try to get this to be more general, but it gives you a sense of what it means to try to get a language to under, sorry, get a system to understand language in order to navigate the world. And so I wanna give you a similar sense of what that might look like for manipulation. So first, let's talk about what that looks like and why this shows up. As I said, we can't supervise everything. We kind of can't have that kind of infinite set. So right now, what happens is that you go to your phone, and you say, hey, Siri, I want you to remind me to do my laundry or something. And what you'd kind of like it to do is not just put that in a piece of uh, like a, in the app and sort of as a string of text. What you'd really like it to do is reason a little bit. You'd like to be like, well, if there's detergent, then I should remind you at home. If not, then I need to remind you to buy detergent when you're at the store, then that has this dependency. There's this notion of a task plan. So when we start interacting with the world, we start having tasks that have to come in a certain order. A has to be done before B, and we have to sort of understand all those dependencies. So one question for the community is just, how do you build better task plans? And that's a little bit of what we saw at the beginning with SayCan. 
But then there's the second thing, which is, you know, if we're here talking about robots, which is, hey, Siri bots do my laundry. That's pretty complicated because that has to go all the way down to all those motor controls that we were just discussing. So again, as a community, we've made a lot of simplifying assumptions, and then we've been working to make things more realistic. So I'm just going to start with one simple environment. This is an environment called Alfred, where you have a goal, in this case, to place a warm slice of bread on the counter, and the agent is moving around what is basically a video game in order to pick up the objects to accomplish this. Here, putting a gray bowl with a watch in it. So understanding that you have to put one object inside of another uh, for the previous thing, if you're going to make slices of bread, then you have to understand that you find the loaf, you find the tool, you need to apply one to the other in order to accomplish these kinds of changes. And what's hard about this, right, is if we go back to that alignment problem from a second ago, the alignment is now even worse because it's, it's a function of when. So it's not just, oh, you know, what's the most recent piece of language that was used? It's also now a problem of, well, hold on, did I already cut this? That means I can't uncut it. Oh, wait, did I already heat this? Do I need to now cool it? So there's this notion that what you're seeing is not sufficient. You have to understand something about the state of the objects as well. But here's just a simple example of what an agent might look like as it's actually doing this. It takes in some high level, in this case, silly instruction to put a cold lettuce slice in the wastebasket. And you saw that we started off with no map and the agent was building a map. So it's observing the environment. It had a list of goals that it wanted to accomplish. And then as it starts to figure out where objects are in the environment, it starts to accomplish these goals. So this is really focusing on, can we build a representation of the world? Do we understand the meaning of the instruction in terms of the objects that need to be used? But it's not quite actually manipulation. It's assuming that the simulator is going to kind of take care of that for us. So what might this look like in a simple setting? So I'm going to start us off with this paper called Clipport, where you have it, you see these instructions, fold the cloth in half, put the red blocks in the green bowl. And so what they're doing here is that they're actually um, executing the, the language instructions on a physical robot. And the way they're doing that is that they're figuring out what are the key points? What are the key locations for understanding the concept? So if I need to, in this case, on the right, sweep the beans into the yellow zone, then the key location for me to start is just the left of the beans. That's where I need to sweep from. And then where do I need to stop? I need to stop just to the left of the yellow zone. So there's this understanding about that action. And then if we take that same, the same authors, they then generalized to 3D space. And so here you have their follow-up work called uh, Perceiver Actor. So here we have pressing down the hand sanitizer. Now, the notion of where to put your uh, put the, the gripper, where to locate, locate things is actually sort of in free space in 3D. So it's no longer that simple plane, start here, swipe across. Now, you sort of have to understand, wait a second. So if I want to be able to reach the drawer, I need to make sure my hand is located at a certain distance from it. If I want to drop something in a basket, then I need to make sure that it's hovering just enough above it. And so this is some super cool work from about a year ago um, on this question of sort of how do we figure out, how do we take the words, the language words, and then actually map those to a physical location in space. This point in, in 3D space is where we want to do this. And so that's what's happening. That's what's happening here. I want to I want to introduce one other really cool reason to think about manipulation, which is knowledge acquisition. So this is some older work, but I think the core concept still holds, which is that if I was to put you or a robot in front of a bunch of objects like this, and I'm going to play a game of I spy in this case, so I spy an object that blank, what are the properties that you might think these objects have? You might think, oh, well, I've got that alignment problem. I've got the words over here. I've got what's coming in with my sensors. I've got to figure out what things to record so that I can figure out what words correspond to them. You're like, well, I have the shape of the objects. I have the color of the objects. Maybe I have the use of the objects, you know, something that's a, um, good for drinking water out of versus something that contains butter in this case. But now, you might also be thinking there's other things that someone might want to request. So here the person asks for the object that's half full. How do we, what do we align half full to? It's not going to be any of those uh, three things that we just discussed. It uh, might mean the weight 
of the object, and we have to compare that to how much we think it would weigh if it was full. It could be if it rattles when I shake it. Maybe that's the notion. So I think what's really cool about thinking about language interfaces with robots, and the reason I want to sort of encourage people to dig deep into it, is what are all the things that you just don't even realize that you know about objects? And then how do you find that correspondence? So where is this building? Why are you doing this? Well, we're building towards collaboration. We want to actually interact with the robot. We don't want to work together with the robot. So I want to give you a really, really simple, but my favorite example of this from Pragmatics. I have this instruction, put the orange block to the right of the green block. And here are my blocks. And I normally, if we were all sitting in a room together, I'd ask people to raise their hands if they think this is the right answer. And then some people would raise their hands. And then I go, oh, what about this one? Like, oh, I don't know. That's like a better answer. What about this one? Mm, no, it's kind of a worse answer. What about this one? They're all correct, except that for some reason, that second one feels more correct. And the idea here is that we only ever say what's necessary to say. So because there is an existing symmetry in the other blocks, we assume that should be the case for the next one. But this makes it really hard to learn, right? So this is why it's a really interesting learning problem. We don't have a discrete grounding of right is a function called right. Instead, we have right is, I don't know, you know, this distance on the x-axis, except that only this distance when the other blocks have these distances. And so that's that. What, what we're starting to see here is social context to understanding. So it's not the case that there's just a simple answer. It's a social context, in this case, the set of blocks in front of us that defines how to interpret that language. And this just gets more interesting, but also harder when we start talking about dialogue. So if I have an agent that's navigating from the, where we started, it needs to know when to ask a question. We were talking about it getting lost, but it then has to know how to ask a useful question. Like it probably shouldn't just be a, like a little baby that screams and yells for help. That's not very useful. It needs to tell us why it's confused or what's going wrong. But then that means that we need to be able to provide a useful answer. So we have to be able to understand where it's coming from. It then needs to be able to execute those actions. And so this, this causes this kind of loop this, that we're so used to when people get confused when talking to us. So I need to understand what I'm uncertain about so that I can figure out what you might be uncertain about so that I can figure out whether or not you're uncertain about the things that I'm uncertain about and so forth. And so we can do this kind of exploration again within simulation. This is an, another piece of work where they looked at trying to collect dialogues of humans in a simulator. And so we have... Um, in this case, a bunch of these same sorts of tasks. So how do we give instructions? How do we ask for clarification? And how do we answer usefully? So I wanna now leave the sort of existing work and kind of uh, talk for a couple minutes about sort of some of the bigger questions. So when we say we're talking to robots, are we really talking to a robot? I was saying it's all about definitions. So what is a robot? Is it just the high level stuff that we're interested in? Is it calling a set of APIs? Or do we really care about the exact way, the path that the agent took or the way that their arm moved in space? I mean, who's the we here? Is it just adults? Is it just in English? Is it just experts in a specific domain? You know, we're maybe very good at producing Python to make a robot work, but that's maybe not, you know, the right way to communicate with a robot. Uh, and related to that is sort of what is talking. Is it just instructing, which is where we started? Um, is it collaborating, which is where we were starting to build to? Is the input coming in in text? Is it coming in in speech? And everything that I've shown you today basically falls into this kind of middle category. Sort of uh, English speaking adults that are instructing a robot to perform some task. And where I think is really exciting for us as a community is to start moving past that. So what does it mean to be collaborating with a robot? That means that the robot might be teaching us some things. Maybe we aren't familiar with robots, but it's still going to be useful for us to be able to interact with it. How do we make it sort of almost kid-friendly? And how do we make sure that there's feedback from the environment that's informing it? So when we say, oh, here's a new concept, rattling, how do we make sure that it's actually able to learn that? And that brings us to sort of why doesn't ChatGPT just solve everything? Why isn't it the case that all of this is seems cool and all, but like we've got this this thing, it's really good at helping me cheat on my homework. I'm sure it's pretty good at robotics too. And the way to think about that is a couple of questions. First of all, what are the things that language will sort of never express or never express fully? 
And one of the things I think is useful if you speak more than one language and someone asks you to translate something, sometimes you're like, ah, I translated the words, but I didn't, I, it didn't really quite capture. So that's a, that's a really interesting question about sort of like, what does it mean to capture things that are maybe not going to show up in text? Then there's a flip of that, though, which is one of the things that robots will never learn without language. This is really easy for us. Why did we learn to read? Why do we go to school for so long? Because there's so much content there. But then when do we give up and watch a video? Because those instructions for learning how to knit not actually as helpful as actually just watching somebody do it. Same with a lot of baking, things like this. But it's still useful for some reason to keep the captions on because I still want to actually hear what they have to say. But oftentimes I have to really practice it before I understand it. So there's kind of a back and forth here. And the, the language models only are getting a small piece of that. They're really probably not doing a lot of reasoning, but they're really good at summarizing knowledge. They're really good at summarizing what's on the internet. And so that means that when we look at our specific setting, we might ask some questions like, what about my situation is within the sort of things that I would normally see on the, in the internet versus actually kind of distinct. It's maybe more unique to me. Um, what is it that, um, you know, is sort of a, a natural follow on of the concepts that I would see on the internet versus this is the weirdest, no one's ever done it this way. My family does it the weirdest way possible. Um, and these are also going to be relevant for when do we not want to inherit from something else. So maybe that's the normal way, but that's not how we do it because there's like, for example, cultural differences that are not being uh, captured there. So I'm going to close with a couple slides about kind of like a little bit high level, but sort of first steps if you want to think about these problems more deeply. So one thing here is I'm going to recommend driving a robot to perform a task. It could be any robot, some simple, simple thing. But think about what it is that you need to do. How hard is it to drive this robot? And if you wanted to try to teach it a concept, whatever the description of the task is, what data would you need to store? So are the inputs to your controller sufficient? Um, is the final state of the, of the scene or the location that your little remote control car got to, is that enough to describe it? Or was there more information that was important? And what is that information? Remembering that the robot has a different body than you do. So the way that you maybe think about something isn't going to apply in the same way that you would change your instructions if you were giving them to a kid versus um, if you were giving them to an adult. And so that maybe makes certain things easier for it and makes certain things harder for it. We're also kind of living through an interesting transition into sort of the world of kind of AR, VR. So then there's a question of like, well, what is, how does that change this whole conversation? Does maybe tracking my hands, same way that we were moving towards tracking eyes earlier, does that start, of, start to make it easier to train robots? What would it look like to collect maybe a VR data set for this? Now that I'm seeing through the robot's eyes, can I give instructions that are maybe more useful to it? And there's some simple engineering questions there, like what does an AR VR data set look like for robots? And then finally, since I think a lot of us are just playing around with these language models anyway, there's so much knowledge in them, but there's so much more knowledge in the world. And so starting to think about where are there places that are sort of unique that these things are failing? You're like, ah, every time I ask it for help with the following, it just seems to get it wrong. It doesn't seem to understand this basic thing about physics, or it doesn't seem to understand that when you're baking, you really shouldn't do that. So what are those kinds of places where an agent that is interacting with the world would learn those things, but a system which is only reading about them wouldn't, and starting to kind of curate those kinds of things. I think a, a data set like that would be super cool. So to close, I think language is super cool. Obviously, um, if you've been listening to me now for like 30 minutes, uh, that's all been in, all, that's a lot of language, sorry. Um, and we all speak lots of different languages, which are themselves cool. And so I think the hope is that we kind of get robots as excited about learning language as, as we are. And so with that, I'll close and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, yes, great talk. Um, so I'll start with a question that's more, um, I think kind of a more curiosity that I have. It's like, um, for, and at least the feeling that I have is that like in this kind of more social interactions we might have with robots, like it, it, it will, well, at least comparing to how humans interact, it's probably important 
to like for the robot to kind of understand what the humans are feeling and we usually understand this by either facial facial expressions or how people say so maybe someone is happier and excited and the robot knows that oh okay i can interact more with this person but if someone like i don't know in a shop or something is angry or grumpy or oh, maybe i should stay here and then don't interact a lot with them but is this something that like i'm just curious is this something that people are actually working on something that actually matters Oh, I'm sorry, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, uh, let me break apart your, your question into a couple pieces, I think. So um, let me focus for a second on just this sort of angry or the frustration, the sort of the, the emotion aspect. There's, there's an entire field of effective computing, which just thinks about what is uh, sort of, how is emotion represented? Um, how do you understand the, the sort of the context for that? How is it the same sentence has very different meanings. And so something I didn't really dive into, um, but I think is a great area to, for people to continue to explore, is I mentioned why it is that we, or maybe why we would be interested in having audio instead of having text, right? So why I don't wanna type this. And it's because of exactly this. It's sort of this understanding that like, no, 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 no. Like if I, one of my favorite examples is I say, um, if I ask you for a glass of water, is very different than if I yell at you to bring my EpiPen. So if I'm having an allergic reaction and I'm screaming about it, like I don't, I don't, I don't mean come carefully, take your time, you know, so it, it really changes the meaning of that. Even if in both cases, I was just yelling, let's say from across the room, get me blank. And so I want to make sure that those things are, are actually distinguished. And so I need to learn how to find that correspondence, that alignment again between those and, and what's going on. I think the other aspect um, that's sort of maybe implicit in, in your question comes to comes at this issue of sort of the differences in our embodiments. So something that is really interesting, kind of, uh, for example, safety people think about is what um, what does an interaction, a collaboration look like when we're not the same physical form? So if I'm collaborating with, uh, like in Stephanie's case, a, um, a forklift, I don't really ever want it to get that close to me. And so when I say come here, um, what I probably mean is something about like coming, but then slowing down and then really, you know, and if I'm telling a, you know, a, like a, a puppy to come here or some other sign of thing like this, I'm okay with them running straight into me and it's sort of adorable. So there's a lot of these things that are really interesting about how that same phrase actually has a very different um, meaning in these, in these cases. So um, hopefully but if I can dive into those more, but hopefully those are the kind of the basic uh, components. Oh, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, well, and so next question is, uh, going back to the beginning, when you presented those three ways we learn things, do you think that the things we learn from physically interacting with the world in the beginning is important to what we learn from books later on in the sense of connecting abstract concepts to the real world? Yeah, I think that's 100% the case. Um, I think there's a lot of debate. My understanding is there's a lot of debate in the cognitive science literature about um, the extent to which this is true and in what cases. Uh, I might recommend a couple of books um, before I dive in more. So I think Metaphors That We Live By by Lakoff is is awesome. And um, Mind in Motion uh, by uh, I think Barbara Tversky is also wonderful um, if you really want to sort of go deep on this. But but basically, um, the premise of a lot of these is that we have sort of a shared representation for a lot of concepts, uh, both spatial and and abstract, and or, or physical and abstract. And so, what we're building there, we actually do bootstrap off of. And so, there's one answer to this question, which is yes. So, for example, moving forward through time, moving, making progress on a project, these very abstract things that are coming from maybe just understanding, taking one step in front of the other to start. But I think there's another dimension to this, which is sort of a data efficiency um, issue, which is that if you think about the way that computer vision trains, uh, classically trains a discriminative model of, let's say, a detector, what you do is you collect tens of thousands of images of cats, and then you say, hey, these are all cat. Find what's similar about all of them. And so what does it do? It finds that uh, there's a certain shape of nose, maybe their ears, some fur, but that's very different than your representation of a cat. And I think the reason for that is because of that play. 
you held your cats, you've you've seen how how squirmy they are, how weirdly flexible they are, things like this. And so you have this very rich um, tactile, auditory, you know, uh, sort of skeletal even model of this animal. So then when your parent comes along and says, oh, that's a cat, you already built the concept. So you only needed them to say the word cat a few times because the concept already existed versus in that in that computer vision. trying to use the label to figure out what the concept was. And so I think that's the secondary part here that's that's really important. Okay, great, thank you. So moving on to the next question is, um, I'm curious about your perspective on the potential dynamics if the robots were to engage in chain conver chains of conversations with humans. Um, so if they can ask instead of just listen. Um. Yeah, so I very much think that having robots ask is core. And I think you saw that show up a couple places. Um, the basis for that, so for example, like the, am I lost? If I'm lost, I have to figure out what to ask about. Or if I need to, uh, to if I don't know how to accomplish something, I need to ask that. What's hard about it, or there's a lot of things, but I think one of the things that's really interesting is that the core to that is understanding your own uncertainty. So if you if we ignore robots for a second, just think about yourself. When do you ask? You ask, it's some balance between, well, I don't want to bother that person, so I don't want to ask too much or too many things. Um, but on the other side, I'm pretty confident that I've tried everything that's possible, or I've 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 never heard this term before, or something like this. And that's that's a really interesting thing to try to model inside of a robot or any kind of system, is okay. How do I know if I, it's, it's sort of metacognitive, right? It's, 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 do I, how do I know that I don't know this? How do I know that I've already tried everything that's reasonable to try? How do I know if it's reasonable to ask for help here? And so that's actually quite difficult, um, but I think is super, super fascinating. I think, I think we're going to see a lot of progress on in the next few years. And that's the basis for then having the robot that asks. There's one other concept I want to introduce here, though, which is this notion of sort of information or knowledge asymmetry. So if we think about a classroom, there's that's the easiest case where there's asymmetry. You have a teacher, they know some information, the student doesn't, and you want to make sure that that information flows from the teacher to the student. But in most cases, we all have some knowledge that someone else doesn't have. So like if we're collaborating on something, you know, maybe I know how far along I am in this dish or how much longer it's going to take me to, to finish cooking some part of dinner. And you know how long it's going to take for the dishwasher to finish or how what time our, you know, our friends are coming over. So one of the things that I think is missing in most robot systems is that we assume the first case. We assume that the robot knows nothing and that the person has all the knowledge and they're just trying to give it to the robot. But the more interesting and more realistic case is that the robot does know some things. It's maybe explored the building more accurately than you have. It maybe has a perfect memory of, of where all the objects are that it's seen. And so you really kind of want to get to that. It's asking for help, but it's also offering help. Um, it's asking for clarity. And that back and forth is, I think, the much more natural interaction that you want to be able to build towards. Yeah, this sounds very exciting, actually. Um, so moving on to the next question. Um, so uh, this person says, I agree that there's lots of ambiguity in natural language commands, but you, we humans are usually able to understand them very easily because of the context. So how does current research leverages this? Um, so... Uh... Let me make sure I understand exactly. So the the we are able so, so the, the the core of this comes down to understanding the definition of context. So the, the I I completely agree. We are able to disambiguate um, by virtue of use of the context. But what's interesting slash hard when you move to implementation is the actual enumeration of those variables. So let me be a little bit more concrete. So. What do we mean when we say context? What we mean is these are the objects, let's say, that are in the room. But we also mean what are the set of things that I've been trained to do before? 
We also mean, what are the things that you've asked me to do before? We also mean, what are the things that I maybe just know about you because of where you're from or your position or something like this? And so context is actually, we, we can keep going, but you get the idea. It's, it's actually a pretty long list of things. So what's happening when, when we are uh, figuring out the uh, sort of how to resolve that ambiguity is that we're taking all of that into account. And you can see this really clearly when you're interacting with a new person in a new environment and you use very simple cues to try to um, figure something out. So you're in a new country and you're ordering at a restaurant and you don't know the etiquette. Does the waiter bring the check? Am I supposed to ask for the check? Is it rude if I ask for the check? You, you get into this weird thing where you're like, they said, have a nice day. Was that because I leave? You know, you, you just don't know. And then why don't you know? It's it's still the same restaurant. You've been in a million restaurants before. You've eaten a million meals before. It's because the social context has changed and you don't have a good enough model of this culture or this person. And so that's part of what then has to happen for these robots, right? Is that we really have to be able to make that explicit because it has to get implemented. <laughs> it has to turn into code. So we have to really, uh, at our model weights, we really have to uh, get that very concretely uh, represented so that it can be leveraged by the robot. Oh, yeah. It's it, <laughs> what's what's tricky, I think, about this, like working on this is that because we like for us, it's so easy, you kind of take it for granted. But when you start to thinking about it, it's insanely complex. Uh, and so, oh, oh, please. No, no, no. I was going to say, this is the classic thing, I think, with robotics, right? I think the class yeah. classic example is that uh, it, it is um, the comparison between computers that play chess versus computers that walk. And we think, ah, we walk all the time. <laughs> like, that's not so hard. Well, we don't have a bunch of walking robots, um, but we do have superhuman chess players. Yeah. I, I remember, and I, I watched the... Um... Okay, uh, we might be going like... That's okay. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, but it, yeah. Just, it was just so funny. It's like I was watching... I, I think it was Fei Fei Li who said this when I was watching like in the YouTube videos. She was talking about kind of how like the early days of computer vision. So there was a summer, like uh, some university, they were planning a summer camp to solve computer vision in the right. summer. Yeah. So it's like... That's right. We, we we open our, our eyes and we see, so it should be easy, right? And it was like 30, 40 years ago. <laughs> We're still That's working right. on it. <laughs> yeah, um, but it's exciting. It's exciting. These are really yeah, fundamental yeah. questions. So, yeah. yeah. And, okay, so uh, next question is, with all these um, open source LLMs uh, coming out now, how do you think we students can leverage it in our own projects? Yeah, um, lots and lots and lots of ways. So um, probably too many to answer here. So let me just try to um, distill a couple a couple uh, concepts. So I think um, one thing one thing that's really interesting about being able to run an LM yourself is that you can think about the context in which you need to be able to make react uh, resp uh, a system respond where it doesn't necessarily have access to the internet. So that's a really simple one, which is basically, do you want your system, um, you know, let's say you're out in the field, you know, it should be able to, to still make decisions. This is also really interesting from a privacy standpoint, which is that you don't necessarily want the system, which is scanning the environment and learning all about you, um, to be sending all of that back up to the, to, to the internet to be shared. And so there's a really great question about how do you build sort of um, language understanding robots that are unique to you, safe to you, local to you. Uh, and, th and that's sort of its own whole area on device, uh, edge computing, stuff like that, which is super fascinating. There's another uh, completely different aspect of this, which is that we don't really understand the knowledge representations that these LMs are building. And so I think at the end there, I was saying like, oh, why is it that it knows about this or that it can make this inference, but it can't make that inference. And so these open source models allow us to really dig into that a little bit. So why is it, what about, about the training data allowed it to make this inference? Or why is it that it seems to know that uh, it probably will get this right, but as a silly example, maybe it knows that forks are made of metal, but it doesn't know that sticking a fork into, a, into the outlet will shock you. Or maybe it knows that it'll shock you, but it doesn't know that you could com uh, complete a circuit with it. And so it's like, why, what, what's happening there? So 
if we understood those representations where it's like, oh, it understands something about circuitry and physics, but that's over here. And then it understands something about uh, cutlery and uh, and materials, but that's over, over here. And there seems to be this mismatch where it hasn't had um, examples to figure out how to bridge these. So, so that's definitely um, a big one. And then I think a really, really practical thing, if you wanted to just try to deploy some systems uh, quickly, is that there's an increasingly uh, good community of code-based models. So we didn't talk about code as policies or prog prompt um, or these kinds of papers, but there's this really great idea, which is that we don't know, I was talking about concepts that are low level and then high level, and we sort of don't know how to bridge them. And one way that we do this all the time as programmers is through libraries. So what, what do we do? We import another library. And that library then has this really complicated logic in order to build up from some more basic items. There's nothing that in principle that says that we couldn't do something very similar with robotics. Taking these models and trying to get them to build sort of um, intermediate level skills. So instead of just moving forward half a meter or angle a certain moving at a certain angle, but like what does it mean to produce a, a policy, produce a procedure that accomplishes some small task. And then using, and then the code model can then look at that and be like, oh, now that I have this high level function call, this new API, I can leverage that to do something even more complicated. So there's also kind of a whole big, so that's, I mean, that's not exhaustive, but those are maybe three areas immediately, sort of a lo local privacy slash offline, um, understanding the representations and this entire burgeoning field of uh, a sort of co-generation models. Oh, okay, great. Thank you again. Uh, so now moving on to, yeah. the, to the last question, which, which is like, um, just so the students over there can kind of have some guidance is um, what, what do you think are kind of important background knowledge and experience that students like would be very important for them to have as they like if they are interested in like engaging this kind of work and research yeah so i think that the 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 biggest thing i'm going to do is tell you um not to try to learn everything so i think that one of the things that can be a little bit overwhelming uh particularly when we're talking about an intersection of fields so if we think about what i've brought up today We've talked about language. We've talked about speech uh, as input. We've talked about computer vision. We've talked about robots of various different kinds. We've talked about simulators versus physical ones. Um, you can't get five, I mean, you could, I guess, get five bachelor's degrees or five PhDs, but I'm not gonna recommend it. Um, I think instead what you wanna do is figure out a specific um, interaction or application that is of interest to you and then really dive into what about it makes it interesting and unique and then learn the requisite skills as part of it. So I do think a basic natural language processing, computer vision, robotics or mechatronics type of course um, would be helpful. Like I think being able to take those would be great, but I think you'll find that um, after you've taken, let's say three or four of those kind of general courses, it, uh, it starts to get uh, the space of knowledge is huge and it starts to get really big really, really quickly. And you could go really deep on any of those. And so um, you have to kind of define the boundaries. So I'll give you a really concrete example for myself. Um, I don't work on deformable objects. So I don't work with cloth. I don't work with, you know, you know, things that, that are squishy. Uh, it's not that they're not interesting. There's so many, I just, there's cool terms there. There's cool concepts there, like that you'd be able to learn linguistically even, but there's just a whole community of people who work on that. And I've decided I'll wait for them to make more progress and then I'll and then they'll let me know. So I kind of kind of define a little bit of a sandbox for myself, a little playground, and then kind of work within that playground. Well, thank you very much. Well, I hope this helps the students out there. Uh, yeah, and this is the end of our session today. So Thank you very much for joining us. It was, yeah, it was really great, really exciting to hear about your work. Um, well, I hope the students uh, will uh, be able to, I don't know, get like uh, leverages, leverage this some way for the their, their future endeavors. And hopefully, I, I tried my, if you go to um, the my course website, so talkingtorobots.com is my group website. There's some additional resources that hopefully may be helpful for reading. But thank you for having me. And it's exciting for people to be even thinking about the space at all. I think it's one of these things where 
I showed you what's happened in 10 years, but um, it's much more exciting what everyone else is going to do in the next 10 years. So it'll be really fun to kind of watch that. And so hopefully there's some people out there who, who invent some really cool stuff. Yeah, that's what we are all hoping for. Oh, thank you very much for thanks everyone who joined and see you in the next session. Bye bye.